Good evening and welcome to this year's virtual Orkney Aviation Festival brought to you by the Orkney International Science Festival team. My name is Julie Rich and I'm delighted to be co-hosting this evening's event from Kwailu in Orkney and to be delivering this year's programme directly to you wherever you are. We're excited for this evening's talk from Airships to the Space Race Women's Technical Contributions by Dr. Nina Baker. But before that, we'll have a few words from Moya MacDonald on the Orkney Aviation Festival. Moya is a founding member of Another Orkney Production, an Orkney-based heritage organisation who run three annual programmes. Orkney Archive Film Project, Billy's Night Out, Celebrating Scapa Flow, and from 2014, the Orkney Aviation Festival, working closely with the Orkney International Science Festival, Bursi Heritage Trust and Argos, Aviation Research Group for Orkney and Shetland. Between 2017 and 19, another Orkney production led a project creating a heritage trail, commemorating the centenary of the Royal Naval Train, the Jellicoe Express. And there are now 19 plaques between Euston and Thurshaw. Moya left Orkney many years ago to do a history degree and is now in Harrington. Good evening, Moya. Hello there, Julian. Thanks for that introduction. Um, this has been a most extraordinary uh, aviation festival for us. Uh, usually we have four days of events and sometimes a visiting aircraft. And this year, we, thanks to the, the Science Festival, at the point where we thought we were going to have to cancel as so many other organizations have had to do this year. We were given this opportunity to have three events all on this day. And from Commander David Hobbs this morning and the 55th anniversary of the Britain Norman Islander uh, following on from there, we've had a, a, an absolutely wonderful program. Thanks to, to you folks. Tonight's talk is uh, an absolutely brilliant one to, to round us off. Uh, Dr. Nina Baker, I had the great pleasure of hearing her talk in Edinburgh last year at the National Library of Scotland. And I can tell you she wasn't phased by the fact there was a, a um, fire emergency in the middle of it and we all ended up out on the pavement. And as it was a talk about women in engineering, we were delighted to see that the first fire officer into the building was a woman. But uh, Nina's, Nina was completely unfazed. It was as if there had never been the interruption and on she went and it was just a, a marvellous talk. So I'll hand over to you, Julie, and thank you so much for all, all the work you're doing for us and um, over to you. Thank you, Boya, and you're welcome. Um, our speaker tonight, Dr Nina Baker, is an independent engineering historian specialising in the history of women in engineering. She has had a varied career, mainly in traditional male typical fields, starting out as a deck officer for the Merchant Navy. She later studied for an engineering degree as a mature student, followed by a PhD in concrete durability. Nina gave us an amazing talk on Monday the Women in Shipbuilding for this year's Grimm and Lecture, which you can now watch on the Orkney International Science Festival YouTube channel, so I do recommend it. Now, Nina, you're going to bring to life some amazing histories of women engineers working in aviation. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Uh, first slide, please. Um, I, I'm delighted to be asked to do this uh, concluding talk for the Orkney, Science, Orkney Aviation Festival. Um, uh, as Moira has said, it was touch and go whether anything was going to happen at all. But here we are, um, and we're going to have a quick zip through some examples of some of the technical contributions by women who worked in various aspects of aeronautical engineering. First slide, next slide, please. So our story begins 140 years ago um, in the 1880s when um, balloons 
Hot air balloons were well known and gas balloons containing hydrogen were just starting to be used particularly by the military. And the Royal Engineers had the um, use of some military balloons. Um, but one of the difficulties was that these balloons contained hydrogen, which is, as you probably know, the very smallest um, element we have. And a fabric that could both be extremely light in weight and also very close textured in order to keep the hydrogen from escaping was proving difficult. Uh, rubberized silk was tried, but it was quite heavy. Um, until Colonel Temple at the um, Templar, rather, at the Royal Balloon School, um, discovered um, a shop in the East End of London, um, a chap called Heron was running a shop selling toys. And amongst the toys he sold were scientific novelties, including small hydrogen balloons, which the gas was contained within some material called gold beater's skin. Gold beater's skin, as it sounds, was a particular um, type of, of material on which gold beaters kept their gold leaf. But it has the feature of being um, very, very close textured. It's actually the lining of um, a cow's gut. Um, and the only people at the time in Britain who were able to both process this nasty material and turn it into balloons were this family. Now, I've shown pictures of the women, and that's because although initially the, 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 the male head of household, Casimir uh, Weinling, brought them all across from the Alsace and held the earliest patents, he died before our story starts. And the women of the family continued with the trade of producing gold beater skin and were employed as the very first women to be employed by the Royal Balloon School. Um, and indeed the first women to do any kind of technical work for the military and aeronautical engineering um, in Britain. So the Royal Balloon School moved around a bit, became the Royal Balloon Factory and wound up at Farnborough, um, where it eventually became known as the Royal Aircraft Establishment. These women, um, you can see them in the bottom left hand picture, um, processing this stuff, which behaves a bit like cling film in that it sticks to itself when wet, which allows you to make um, shapes, any kind of shape, without having to sew any seam or use any glue. Next slide, please. Here we have some images from the First World War. So our story in 1880 uh, was still the same story in um, the First World War, the Weinling women were running um, the envelope um, production section of the, the Royal Aircraft Establishment's balloon sheds, and they had trained women in various commercial uh, balloon making, uh, airship making um, companies. The picture in the top right is, is Shorts. Um, the very nice painting top left by Russell Flint of women putting together the gas balloons, and the photo bottom right is of women in the Women's Royal Air Force patching up a balloon. You can see it's sort of translucent because it's this sort of, it's a bit like tracing paper to look at, um, this stuff. And this was very much a women's trade almost from the beginning until uh, synthetic fabrics were introduced in the 1920s. And Madeleine Weinling was the forewoman of the uh, balloon and airship making process at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Next, please. We now make a jump to the post First World War period and a woman called Hilda Lyon. Um, Hilda Lyon, uh, like many young women, had the opportunity during the First World War to take a maths degree at Cambridge University, and she was then directed. Initially, she worked for a couple of um, aircraft manufacturers doing all their stress analysis for, for their uh, new designs of aeroplanes. But she was then recruited to the Royal Airship Works at Cardington, near Bedford, where, where there are still two massive airship sheds. 
and she worked um, on the design of the very famous um, R101 airship and her job at the time was helping to do the design and stress analysis of the transverse frames for that air, for that air, airship. Um, I, I show you this picture um, of her, which was a, a beautiful painting done um, by the mayor of Market Wheaton, which is her hometown. And this plaque on the right is uh, the plaque that was put up um, at the time. So. After she had worked on the R101, um, so next slide, please. After she had worked on the R101, um, about the same time as it was having its disastrous trial flight, she was sailing across the Atlantic to take up a, a research studentship at MIT in America. Um, there, she, she did a master's degree um, looking at the effect of turbulence on uh, the drag of airship models. She was aware from her work at the airship works that wind tunnel tests did not accurately reflect the behavior of the real air airship in practice. And so she was trying to find out why that was and then to discover uh, what the effect of different shapes of airship might be um, on the uh, air resistance. And one of the things that she discovered, and the, the graph on the top left shows her tests of various different airship shapes. Um, she discovered that there was an advantage in having uh, an airship that was not really pointy at the front. Uh, previously streamlining, um, the, the, th the thinking was the more pointy it was at the front, the better the streamlining. But she was able to demonstrate that a, a bluffer shape, a rounder shape at the front, actually allowed more gas to be carried and therefore 66% more payload to be carried without any loss of efficiency due to um, air resistance. And so she devised this sort of almost teardrop shape, round at the front, and pointy at the back, um, which became adopted in America rather than here, where it is known as the, the, the lion shape. Um, it was used for the Albacore class of, of submarines, which is that picture in the bottom middle, which is the Albacore is now a museum, also for uh, some experimental torpedoes, and even the Russians used the lion shape for their submarines at this time. Um, and that is a stamp showing that the Leninsky Consumol submarine, which is the, more or less the same shape as the Albacores. Next slide, please. Um, after various other activities, she, uh, she for instance, she, she had to go home and look after her sick mum. She studied at uh, Göttingen with uh, Professor Prandtl, who was the foremost expert on hydrodynamics at the time. Um, she returned to the UK and in 1937, she started her career at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. And amongst her war work uh, was, was going to uh, back to Göttingen after at the very end of the war, um, to write reports about the work that was being done there and the people that the RAE might recruit um, in the way that the rocket people were recruited um, by America. And we'll come back to that in due course. Her final paper before she very sadly died um, or, or after a, 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 an operation that went wrong, um, she died at the age of 50. And this was her final paper theoretical analysis of the longitudinal dynamic stability in gliding flight and it's very widely uh, cited in other people's papers of all kinds of topics from biomimetics um, to the uh, behavior of airplanes in what's known as fugoid flight and she did some work on the damping um, effects um, of different weights on fugoid movement. And fugoid movement is a very dangerous thing for an airplane. It's when it gets into a, 
kind of standing wave where it goes up and down um, in flight and has led to some crashes in the past. And her work was contributory to trying to understand that some of um, which contributes to the software that is in um, many aeroplanes nowadays. Um, and so I'm very pleased that uh, last year, last summer, we were able to get a plaque in her hometown to commemorate her uh, life and contribution. Next, please. Still during the wartime, um, we now come to a woman that possibly many people listening may have heard of because she has become really well known in recent years. Um, Beatrice Schilling uh, started her engineering career as an apprentice uh, for Margaret Partridge, who you see in the top, in the right hand uh, picture at the top. Uh, Margaret Partridge was um, employing young women as apprentices to help her build small DC power stations for country homes and villages in Devon. And Beatrice Schilling showed so much promise in this training program that the Women's Engineering Society gave her financial help to take a degree in engineering at Manchester University. Um, she went straight to the Royal Aircraft Establishment during the war um, and worked there for the rest of her career. Um, including after she married, um, which at the time female civil servants weren't meant to, but it's clear the Royal Aircraft Establishment turned a blind eye to quite a number of married uh, women aeronautical engineers because they were so important to their work. Um, Beatrice is best known for what's officially known as the RAE restrictor, which is sort of something halfway between a funnel and a washer. Um, in the uh, carburetor, um, in the Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, which were used in Spitfires, um, there was a problem with uh, the flow of petrol when aeroplanes were diving. And her expertise was in fuel and fuel systems and motors generally. And she was given this problem to solve, and this was her solution. Um, it's often known as Miss Schilling's orifice, but the official name is the Royal Aircraft Establishment Restrictor. And to begin with, um, she was using her motorbike to, to bike round RAF stations to train the technicians in retrofitting until uh, Rolls-Royce changed the carburetor to an injection model later on. Uh, she was also a, um, a, a, a Brooklyn's gold star holder for lapping Brooklyn's at over 100 miles an hour on that motorbike. Next slide, please. So after the war, well, at the very end of the war, as I mentioned, um, the British and the Americans went to Germany and basically they raided the place. They took everything they could find about rockets, airplanes, V2 bombers, all sorts. And some of the... Uh, learning opportunities as regards rocket propulsion from the V2s were tested at, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying this wrong, but Unislas, uh rocket testing range in Wales, um, which you can see on the right. And the picture on the left is um, ATS women at the end of the war and in the early post-war days um, who were employed there to do the radar tracking um, these were women who had worked on other um, ballistic ranges elsewhere and were very expert in this work. And they, they continued this um, work in the, in the early post-war days. The Cold War saw a lot of crossover between uh, rockets for space exploration and rockets for war weapons for missiles. Next, please. So we, have, we see Miss Schilling again. Um, she continued to work, and as I say, she was a, a specialist in, in motors. And one of the things she was asked to do was to produce um, the motor and fuel system for the RAE Vickers transonic rocket model. Um, and this was quite a small object, 
um, which was taken up in an aeroplane um, and then launched from an aeroplane um, over the sea to test it. They quickly found that they were um, not getting anywhere because these things were crashing into the sea. So they started using um, what were known as, as test jet test vehicles, which is this thing um, underneath the aeroplane, um, this sort of sloping launch rack on wheels so that they could pick up any broken bits that landed downrange. That they tried a whole lot of different ones. And it wasn't until they'd made jet test vehicle Mark 8 that they had one that could actually um, do what they needed. Um, Schilling was working on um, ramjets and this picture in the bottom right is, is a rare example of her um, looking quite sociable. Uh, with her team at a pub after after the first successful launch of one of their ramjet models. Um, these uh, this type of propulsion uh, was ultimately used in um, the Bloodhound ground to air missile, um, which you can see bottom left, and that was in use up into the 1990s in various forms. And she continued to do um, lots of important work on on uh, rocket early rocket propulsion at a very small size at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Next, please. Here we have two women that also worked on the sort of rocket and missile crossover fields. Both women worked in the industry sector rather than the government uh, in uh, research establishment. On the left, Joan Lavender, who um, worked most of her career at de Havilland, which of course later became uh, Hawker Siddeley and ultimately British Aerospace. Um, and she worked, she was an unusual example of somebody who got into the industry as an apprentice in, a, in an ordinary uh, manufacturing factory never took a degree um, and just worked her way up the system through sheer talent and skill. And she was in charge of um, de Havilland's um, compu early computer-aided design manufacturing division for guided weapons. Um, I'm no expert. I think she's sitting on a blue streak, but I'm not really sure. I'm happy to be told otherwise if anybody knows. Um, the, the Blue Streak was um, an intermediate range uh, ballistic missile, but the rocket part of it was later used as the first stage in the Europa satellite launch vehicles. Below you can see, below her, you can see a model of an Excalibur, which was um, a, a guided artillery shell, quite large. Um, and this is actually a model made by her apprentices. On the right hand side, we have uh, Betty Hodges, um, who, amongst other things, was the president of the Women's Engineering Society. She worked for GEC um, and rose to become their guided weapons project manager. And two of the weapons she worked on were Red Dean and Sea Dart. And Red Dean, again, was one of these um, items that, that crossed over between pure rocketry and missile work. Next, please. So we're getting into the era of the space race, the 1960s. Um, we didn't have our own launch site, um, though we may get one soon. Um, and all our test work had to be done at the Woomera range in Australia. So all the work that I've been referring to, the, the, the named missiles and things of any size, would have to be shipped out literally in a ship um, to Woomera for testing. And a bit like the ladies we saw at the Welsh rocket range, um, at Woomera, they employed a large team of women to do the tracking and indeed the analysis. And as was the way in the days before a computer was um, a lump of metal and plastic on your desk, these women were known as the computers. So they did the tracking on the top picture on the right of, of these two women peering into a, a machine. That is a, a Kine theodolite, 
just like a, uh, an ordinary theodolite, but it takes a film uh, from which you can get the analysis of the behavior of a fast moving um, body flying through the air. Um, these had been in use in various forms during the war um, for artillery purposes and indeed for um, anti-aircraft um, gun emplacement training purposes. And these were more sophisticated versions used for tracking rocket launchers. One of the uh, types of rockets uh, that was tested was Black Knight, uh, a launch vehicle which was used to test the re-entry vehicles for the blue streak. The picture of the lady computers in the bottom right in their sort of quasi-military outfits, although they weren't in the military. Um, the one with the red arrow, that's Mary Whitehead, who was in charge of the team. And uh, she, she, they were all very, very superior mathematicians um, and get very little credit for their work. Uh, in case you're wondering about uh, Red Dean and Black Knight and Blue Streak, these were the rainbow codes, um, which were devised um, from well in World War II and were used up into the 1950s and later for all kinds of technical projects, not just for rockets or missiles. And if you want to know what each color and, and suffix mean, um, there's, a, there's a Wikipedia page for that. Next, please. And here we are, Miss Schelling again. Um, this is her working on her high altitude test plant, which she designed and commissioned herself. And that, the, the, um, the tall cylinder in the middle is a boil off test rig for the Blue Streak oxygen tank, which she was overseeing again because of her expertise in fuels and motor behavior at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. And there is a Blue Streak and you can see the boil off bit um, near the bottom with those sort of vertical strips um, had to go out to be tested at um, Woomera. Next, please. But the women at the Royal Aircraft Establishment weren't all involved with aerodynamics or motors. Quite a lot of them were involved in what we would call um, ergonomics and uh, human um, elements of the aerospace program. During the war, one of the things that started to become apparent is when you fly high and fast, not only have you got the effects of G-forces on the, the um, blood flow of the pilots, but you also start to run out of oxygen to breathe. And a number of women at the Royal Aircraft Establishment worked on some of the earliest um, oxygen masks. Here we see Helen Grimshaw, another woman who had a full career at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, I was one of the earliest to, to join in an engineering capacity. To begin with, she was a wind tunnel expert. In fact, she ran the wind tunnels for some while and was famously the person to whom um, new entrant um, engineers were sent for training and knocking into shape as regards their report writing and their use of wind tunnels. And there are people alive who had that training. She did, during the war, she uh, worked on some of the glider tugs that were used to carry troops into battle. And she actually wrote the manual on how to drive glider tugs. But she also worked on oxygen masks and some of the early pressure suits. And you can see in this photograph, this is her retirement to do at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. And her retirement present included a model of the space, of the, the, the the space suit that she helped to work on, the first pressure suit. And the picture on the right is that pressure suit um, type in the London Science Museum. Um, she worked with a woman called Kate Maslin. Next, next slide, please. Um, Kate Maslin also had a full career at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. And she too worked on the sort of human elements. She, she did work on the design of um, flying helmets, both for the oxygen use and for the uh, communications for radio. And for the, she did a lot of studies about the effects of noise and vibration on uh, pilot performance. 
which of course as as um, aircraft and rockets got, got higher and faster and of course rockets are quite quite strong vibrations it was important to know whether people could still perform under those circumstances she did work on um carbon dioxide circulation in the first space capsules and also did work on the first space suits and we can see an example on the right of some of what some of these early space suits were like next slide please and this brings us um into uh the, the civil aviation area the royal aircraft establishment was not exclusively at the service of the military it was also largely there to support civil aviation for the development and safety testing of aircraft and also to help um, find out what goes wrong when there's an accident and some of the uh, some of our listeners of of, of uh, an older age group may recall from the 1950s, the infamous crashes of the airliner, the Comet. Um, there were a number of these crashes, unexplained to begin with, largely based, largely blamed on pilot error, um, until they were able to get hold of um, enough pieces to test to find out what was going on. And this was work that was given to um, the Royal Aircraft Establishment to try and sort out. Next, please. And here we see two of the women who did that work. Anne Burns, um, a, another uh, full career woman at the aircraft, Royal Aircraft Establishment, and Kate Maslam. And they, between them, developed the first ever in-flight stress gauge testing systems. And the picture at the bottom middle is of the in-flight uh, stress testing station on a comet that they were using in order to test what was going wrong. So they put these strain gauges all over the aircraft. They took it up, they flew it to try and simulate what was going wrong. And as well as doing tests, uh, there were various um, ground-based tests as well. Um, which uh, produced the, the answer that um, it, it was a, a, a fatigue fracture. But Anne Burns and Kate Maslin between them um, did a lot of work to contribute to that. And if anybody um, is looking for a delightful fictionalized uh, version of this story, um, the film with Jimmy Stewart um, in, uh, which is called No Highway in the Sky, um, is, is a delightful, uh, film and it was filmed at the Royal Aircraft Establishment in, in their test facilities. Next, please. But the other thing that Anne Burns is particularly remembered for, and her biography is called Clear Air Turbulence, is the discovery of this um, meteorological phenomenon known as clear air turbulence. And this is the problem that arises where you get um, invisible turbulence taking place in the sky when two jet streams are flowing in opposite directions. And again, in the 1960s, there were a number of very serious air crashes. Um, nobody had any idea why. Planes just falling out of the sky in apparently the finest possible weather. And she became literally the world's expert um, in clear air turbulence and why it happens uh, and what to do about it and how to detect likely circumstances in which it's taking place. Um, ironically, the Japanese had already known something about this before the war uh, because of unusual um, air, air conditions over their flight paths in Japan. But the war intervened and nothing was done with that knowledge. Um, until much, much later, and uh, she she became a very well-known expert on this problem. Next, please. Uh, we now come to Joanna Weber. Um, she was a German woman who, like uh, Hilda Lyon, trained at Göttingen. She worked all through the war um, on 
various aspects of swept wing design. And in 1945, when Hilda Lyon went with the team to Göttingen to see what they could take in the way of, and by the way, they took all their wind tunnels as well as some of their people. Um, Hilda Lyon wrote a report about the knowledge base at Göttingen and, and not naming any names, but giving examples of the work that was being done and the results that had been found. And this drawing in the middle um, is an example of um, some of the work that would have been what Joanna Weber was working on because she was looking into various wing profiles um, for their behavior um, in different conditions, particularly um, transonic conditions, you know, approaching supersonic speeds. So she was recruited and arrived at the Royal Aircraft Establishment in the autumn of 1946. And very tragically, she and Hilda Lyon barely had any time to work together before Hilda sadly died in the December. But Joanna Weber stayed on at the Royal Aircraft Establishment for another 30 years. And amongst the designs that she was involved in helping with the uh, development and the calculations to show optimization and safety and so on were the VC-10, the Concorde and the Airbus 300B. Um, so she was somebody who really um, crossed over from working entirely for the, for the Nazis to working entirely for us and from the military to the civil and was amongst a large number of people who were recruited both by the UK and the USA to bring their aeronautical engineering skills from Göttingen and elsewhere um, to our service. So that brings me um, to the end of my talk. Next slide, please. Um, here, like, like the first slide, the, both the first slide and this one are pretty pictures from uh, pop popular musical songs of the turn of the century when airships were just starting to become popular. And if only I had an airship, I would certainly love to invite you to come take a trip in my airship. But in the meanwhile, well, that was a very fast zip through some of the work that some of the women at the Royal Aircraft Establishment were doing to help keep us all safe. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Nina. And um, there truly have been some amazing pioneering women. That was great. Um, and as you say, just that's just some of them. We've got some great questions from, from the audience. Um, let me see now. The first one is from Richard. Why was gold bead skin so difficult to process other than it's, cl it's cling filmy? Well, to begin with, um, you, the, 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 the cow guts were saved by um, abattoirs and they were roughly washed and salted down and then they went to the works so they were still really smelly and you had to scrape all the disgustingness out of them and they had to be processed but if if you've ever tried um to work with uh, cling film you will know how it has this habit of wrapping itself on itself and sticking to everything except the thing you wanted to stick to and gold beater skin when it's damp behaves a lot like that. So it had to be stretched and shaped and carefully smoothed so that it could be fixed to another piece um, and then piece to piece to piece to um, make a balloon shape. <laughs> um, so quite tricky to work with. Very fragile. Um, it's very, very fragile. Um, so several layers were required. So for something the size of the Hindenburg airship, they would need three quarters of a million cows worth of wow. gut. That's a lot. And, uh, that and is a like, lot. Yeah, it, it took a lot of sections from, from the photographs, yeah. you know, to make that. You only, you only get a little bit per cow, you know, it's only, you know, you only get sort of pieces about that wide um, once you've unfolded them. 
Yeah, uh, tremendous undertaking. Um, Eric asked who drew up the patterns um, for these huge balloons and how did they scale them up? So I can't hear you very well. Eric asks um, who drew up the patterns for these huge balloons and how did they scale these up? What a lovely question. <laughs> you know, I actually don't know. Um, the, the officers at the Royal Balloon Factory, the Royal Balloon School in the earliest days, would have been doing the designs and they, they would have presumably relied heavily on um, the Vineling family's expertise in making different sizes of balloons to work out how to do the much bigger ones. The, it wasn't just a single layer, they were overlaid um, in different directions. So you might have several layers um, overlaid to make um, something strong. And the outside was then, the whole thing was then very carefully fixed to a silk envelope um, to protect the gold beater's skin from um, contact with anything else. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, Swain's asking, was Hilda Lyon affected by the R101 disaster? Very much so. Um, she, she and the other people at Cardington were taken up on a kind of pleasure pleasure ride um, on quite a windy day, actually. But they all got to go up, and there are a number of photos. I've never found one that's definitely got her in it, but a number of photos of that trip of the staff pretending to be passengers. Um, and she then um, left to go to America, and she heard about the, the terrible crash. And she said it put all the heart out of her for a long time. But, you know, she committed herself to doing this master's degree at MIT, which is obviously a wonderful opportunity. And, and for her, the, the key opportunity was that as a, a master's research student, she had to do all the work herself. So the technicians would help, but she had to set up the wind tunnels, set up all the testing equipment, make the models, do all the adjustments and everything, all the practical work herself. So she did get really quite into that. And afterwards, one of the things she said was if she had her time again, after she'd done her math degree at, at Cambridge, she would have gone to a technical college and done some practical engineering workshop training because she felt very much the, the lack of that practical act, aspect of her training. Okay. And a quick question from Richard. She says, what bike was Beatrice Schilling riding in the picture? Oh, gosh. Too difficult. No, it can't help you. I can't remember. I think a BSA, but I'm really not sure. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a book about Beatrice Schilling, which sadly, the chap who wrote, it, it's called Negative Gravity. It's very difficult to find. Um, the chap who wrote it and self-published it has now been dead for a while. And there doesn't seem to be any sign of his family showing any interest in republishing it. But it gets into all of that level of detail, which I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, a couple of questions about these women. Um, were they recognised with blue plaques? And also, um, was it cheaper to employ these women as computers than to employ a man to do the same task? Oh, yeah, it would have been cheaper to employ it. The, 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 all the women I've been speaking about, the women at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, um, scientific civil servants, they were all paid on the women's grade. So that was throughout that entire period. I spoke, Joanna Weber work, was working there up into the 1970s, so it would have changed at the end of her career, but the civil service had lower pay grades per level for women than it did for men. So they would all have been paid less. And they didn't get promotion to the grade either that um, a man of their uh, expertise would have been likely to expect to get to. Um, the, the archives at Kew are full of letters from um, various departmental managers and indeed the director of the Royal Aircraft Establishment begging the Treasury to allow them to pay these women more on various sort of um, sort of special bonus schemes to try and get round this problem of them not being paid as well as the men. 
Sorry, there was another part to that question. Um, oh, the so, blue um, plaque. Yes, Richard asks, was there many blue plaques, um, commemorative plaques for these women's? I'm, I'm not aware of any. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this one for Hilda Lyon. Um, when I, I, I went to give a talk in 2018 um, in Beverly in Yorkshire about her and got to know some of the people in Market Wheaton. And as a result of that, met some of her family and the Market Wheaton people and her family. And I we were able to get the, this project together to get a blue plaque put up. But no, I'm not aware of plaques. I think Schilling has. And in fact, um, Royal uh, Holloway College has named their electrical engineering building, the Beatrice Schilling building. So she's really well known, but th some of these others people have barely heard of, even if they're in that kind of area of interest. Okay. So if anybody lives anywhere which they think is associated with one of these women and wants to put a blue plaque up, do get in touch. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. I've just had a message that, the, that Beatrice's motorbike was a Norton M30. So there you go. There you go. Right. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry for not remembering that. <laughs> okay. Well, sadly, we'll have to round things up there, Nina. Um, I'm going to hand back to Moya for a few final words um, before I end with some final housekeeping. Oh, gosh, I seem to have gone all dark. Can you hear me? Yes. Great stuff. If you put up with the darkness, folks, sorry about that. The, the light has faded in Haddington. I'd like to say a big thank you to Nina. That was an absolutely fantastic talk. And can I advise all of you watching to rush out and buy her copy of the book? It's absolutely brilliant. It's a great read. And um, hopefully there'll be more to follow, Nina. I do hope so. To round things up from the from the Aviation Festival's point of view, we've had an absolutely fantastic day. Thank you for giving such a great talk at the end, Nina. We started off at two o'clock with, with Commander David Hobbs talking about Squadron Commander Dunning, which was just brilliant. Then we had a, a fantastic discussion about the Islander on the 55th anniversary of, of the, the plane. And I would like to, to thank everybody who, who took part in all these events, to Nina, to David Hobbs, to William Hynett from Britain Norman, um, Andy Allsop, John Firth, Ian Hutchison, to Howie who chaired earlier, to all of you who helped put this on from the Science Festival, you've been absolutely brilliant. And if it hadn't been for you, the Orkney Aviation Festival this year would have been cancelled. Instead, we've had an absolutely fantastic time with some brilliant speakers and all power to you and um, look forward to seeing you on the screen in, in the not too distant future. So back to Julie. Thank you both, uh, Nina and Moya, and to the Orkney International Science Festival technical team. So please join us on Saturday for our Foraging Fortnight film at two o'clock, Tanning Fish Skins by Ziki Bassan followed by a talk at half past three, Outing Foraging by the Flow with Anna Canning and Megan Taylor. And that concludes the virtual 2020 Orkney Aviation Festival. Thank you to everyone for watching and good night. <laughs>